Good morning. Um, let us begin our worship service. Pastor Frank, would you come up and lead us in our opening prayer? You may notice our beloved Dakota is not here today. She is preaching at another church this morning. Our certified lay minister goes out and is invited um, to, by our district superintendent to go preach in other places, to teach classes, and to do a variety of things. So, that's where she is this morning. We give thanks for her leadership here, and we hold her in prayer as she is presenting God's word across our connection. Will you please stand if you are able in body or spirit that we open in prayer. Thank you, sir. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship and welcome to those who are worshiping uh, with us online. We welcome you as well. I invite us all now to join together in our opening prayer. Together, let us pray. God of truth, we come longing for the peace that only you can provide. We seem so often to be tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind except that of your Holy Spirit. Be pleased to dwell here this day, to receive our worship and our praise. Linger long and speak the truth to us in love, that we may come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the full stature of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Your holy name, bless the Lord. 
Well, we've already talked about Thanksgiving, so that should make me talking about Advent not that bad. I don't know. We are just closing in on the end of the year, and that's just the way it is. 2023 is looking for the exit. So we are looking for Advent, and uh, Advent is our time of waiting for the light to come. Advent will start in December, uh, life coming again to the world. Advent um, does begin that first Sunday in December, but we start picking up hints. Uh, it's sort of like spring training for Advent is about November. Um, yes, my brain works that way. I'm just hopeful for baseball. I can't stand it. Okay. Um, today we pick up a scripture from Matthew's gospel. It's a parable, uh, apocalyptic. Um, it's a challenging one, truth be told. Um, and it is about the prepared and the unprepared. Uh, so if you are not a planner or a header, you might get called out on this scripture. You might want to go get your pancakes right now. I'm just saying. It is about planning ahead, getting things done, and being ready. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians and Matthew's gospel challenge us indeed to be ready, to get prepared, but also to wait. Waiting, preparation, getting ready, these can be really challenging topics and challenging concepts for us. Um, in truth, I think the confession is that we are an instant kind of culture with instant kind of expectations. Thank you, microwaves. We have a, a challenging time with time. We want what we want now. So, on this Sunday, as we look towards Advent, we begin. We begin to get our minds, our spirits, our hearts attuned for that season of waiting in the Christian year when the whole focus is about waiting for light, waiting for love, waiting for God. Let me invite uh, our liturgist to come on down front to share our scriptures with us today. Dick Muir, thank you so much. Listen to these two wonderful passages. Thank you, sir. Morning. Today we uh, do read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 and Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede you, precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry command of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Matthew 25, chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. The ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps, and the bridegroom was delayed. Uh, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy, buy them, the bridegroom came, and, though, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. 
Later, the other bridesmaids came along saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he said, replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For the word of God, for the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. You know, some days we gather in, uh, we gather in church, we uh, listen for the good news, and we get a scripture like this. Uh, be prepared, therefore, the wise and the foolish, the compare and the contrast, and the bridegroom wouldn't open the door. Uh, it's, a tough, it's a tough passage, to be sure. Um, waiting, waiting, waiting. While I was growing up, my dad was in the Navy, and he'd go out on the ship for uh, six months at a time. I remember that from as early as... I, two years old is when my dad first started going out, and then multiple times during my growing up years until he retired. As a child, maybe as an adult too, but it, certainly as a child, six months is forever. It is forever, it is endless, and it is difficult to understand. Uh, my dad would leave, he would be gone over the holidays, Christmas, Easter, were not family specific because dad was gone sometimes. That's just the way it was. At some point, I was old enough, uh, old enough to understand the concept of calendaring. So my parents made me a calendar every time my dad was out to sea, uh, and it counted the days down. Dad's return day was day zero, and then every day was assigned a number. I remember usually we would start in the 180s, right? And we would count down until the zero day when he came home. I still remember the year the ship was late and he got home on day plus, you know, two or three. I was so mad. Um, <laughs> it's just not fair sometimes. But that was our family waiting time. We prepared the calendar before he shipped out. We counted down until he came home. Um, and even to this day, uh, whenever the news reports show the, the pictures of the naval ships coming in, I get a little weepy. Um, the families that are being reunited, the kids who get to see their parents, um, that time apart is really challenging. That time of waiting and not having that person or people near you. And it was always a relief to have the time finish, the time of waiting be over. Um, but even when I got the calendar, I can't say that it was easier. Um, waiting is something we can attune ourselves to and mentally prepare for, but our heart still struggles. I realize now that much to most of our life, all of who we are is spent waiting. Um, I don't mean to be glum. It is just inescapable. Every present moment contains a future that has not yet arrived. We are always waiting. We are waiting for something, someone, something. We may fear our future, we may love our future, we may hope or we may hide, but in all of it, we are waiting. How do we wait? Is there a better way? Is there a worse way? I don't think so, actually. Um, Sometimes waiting patiently is calming and it serves us. I think other times waiting impatiently and angrily is a little bit more reasonable and, and appropriate for a situation, particularly when you're waiting for justice to happen. Every life situation depends on context, and so perhaps we develop a theology or a faith conversation about the flexibility of waiting, how we wait, what it is to wait, to some waiting, we plan, we calendar, we look forward in kind of a steady manner. To some waiting, we demand and have urgency for things to move along. At its core, at its heart, at the heart of our faith, it is about waiting. Um, it is about waiting. 
There are many Hebrew words throughout the Bible to express the process or the journey of waiting. There is a word in Hebrew that means just to wait. Just just wait. But there's also another word that to means that means hopeful expectant waiting for that special thing to arrive, for the special thing to happen. Hopeful expectant waiting. There is another word for waiting that means drawn out, desperate waiting. I imagine that waiting is like the waiting for uh, hospital medical results, waiting to hear about a loved one. Are they safe? Are they sound? Did they get home to where they were traveling? Hopeful, expectant, waiting. There's another word that means to wait anxiously. Uh, We could create some sort of Venn diagram of all the words for waiting and how they intersect and how... Um, painful but hopeful some of them are. Waiting is humbling. It reminds us we're human, right? It is a pause. It can be active or passive. It is all over our Bible, all throughout our faith walk. We are always waiting. This many weeks from Advent. So I was thinking about this. I wonder, I don't have an answer for this, so I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, I don't know. I wonder how God waits. Does God wait? Is this only something human beings do, creatures do? Is it only us who waits? I don't know. I could probably argue God waiting from several different perspectives. So we approach this scripture for today. Is this a God waiting kind of passage? There's a delay. Is there a wait? Our stress for waiting and getting on with it meets us in the scripture of these ten bridesmaids. Uh, different, pass- different Bible versions uh, record these, uh, the bridesmaids in a different way. Uh, often they're young maidens, they're young women. They are indeed waiting for a, a bridegroom and a wedding. Um, it is uh, a parable. It points us in a direction. Was it really a wedding? These are a lot of questions that scholars ask. Um, It is an apocalyptic kind of text, looking forward. Uh, And the most significant point, I think, to this passage from Matthew's Gospel is the conclusion. Be prepared. Be prepared even in the event of a delay. Be prepared. A good day to have our Boy Scouts here. Be prepared. It, It resonates with us. We don't like delays particularly. We don't like delays in love and justice. We don't like delays. The scripture brings us in on the delay of the bridegroom. Uh, This is a hint to the delay of Jesus to the world. Yes, God is on the way, but we don't know when. It's part of the point of all of this, this delayed realization of God in the world, God's kingdom to come, God's present reality. What do we do in the, in the waiting? Well, according to this passage, preparation is essential. Get, getting ready is essential. What does it look like? to be ready? What does it look like to prepare to receive Jesus? How do we do this? Uh, It's good to start Advent all all the way ahead of time this way because these are hard kind of things to to ponder. In truth, you know, every we're supposed to get ready for fire season. I don't do that particularly well either. This is a big deal, getting ready to receive Jesus in our hearts, to look for the light, to look for love, to look for what is to come, for God coming to us, to have faith even in the waiting that God is indeed coming. All of that is embedded in this, this passage. So there were 10 young unmarried women. They were gathered. They were waiting for a wedding. Five of them are wise and five of them are foolish, according to the scripture. The five wise bridesmaids took their lamps and the oil to go in them. I'm sorry. Does anybody else not think that that was like obvious? How could the five foolish ones forget the oil? Were they in a hurry? Were they just flaky? What was going on with the five foolish bridesmaids? And why 
why are they calling them foolish or wise? Weren't they just the prepared or the unprepared? All of these things are part of this scripture that we're struggling with. So, the bridegroom was delayed. And all of them, all ten of them, in the waiting, grew tired and fell asleep. Now, I noticed here, this is the kind of thing that bugs me just a little bit. In Mark's gospel, we get a statement about staying awake. Stay awake, therefore, you do not know the hour that is to come. Matthew's gospel doesn't encourage us to stay awake, but to be prepared. Herein, we, we butt up against this kind of theological confusion that we wrestle with, the preparation, the staying awake. In Matthew's gospel, the problem was not taking a nap. The problem was preparation. So at midnight, I don't know if you caught that, at midnight, in the time of the deepest darkness, there are no shadows, there is no light. In that moment, that's when the bridegroom comes. He's coming. The bridegroom is coming. The bridesmaids are called out. He's coming. He's coming. So all of these ten ladies get out their lamps and they trim them, but only half had the oil to provide the light. Only half were ready to receive the bridegroom. The ones without the oil wanted the others to share, but the wise ones said, you go to the dealers, you go and you get your own oil. The five without the oil did go, and when they returned, they were not welcomed into the wedding banquet. What happened to Jesus saying, love your neighbor as yourself? Have you ever read this passage and wondered about that? What is going on here? I've wrestled with that question a lot. Why wouldn't you share? Isn't sharing our value? I think it is, but I think that there's something else. And um, these many years later, this is just part of our wrestling. How do we act with compassion? How do we act with kindness? I've always sort of wondered if the oil of the fuel for the lamp was more than oil. It's not just that tangible oil. It's all I can think of, right? Maybe the oil that fuels the lamp, Jesus, our author, our gospel author, is encouraging us to think about what is it that is the resource that gives our light and our person and our everything that we are the capacity to light? What is the resource that gives our heart the ability to light up, to provide a way, to be a light to the world? This is Matthew's gospel. You are the light of the world. What if those five bridesmaids who were foolish had not invested in their own spiritual journey? What if they were extinguished within and they were empty? They, they hadn't done their own self-care. They didn't sleep enough. They were empty of body and spirit and heart and mind. So this issue of trimming our lamps and being physically present is a call for filling our own selves up so that we might be the light for others. It's one of the things that I've wrestled with every time I read this passage. How do we prepare ourselves in good order? How do we take time to pray, to center with God, to have faith? to not get too cynical in this world that is divided and hard? How do we cling to our God in the midst of challenge? How do we not be distracted to love God as ourself? What if the oil is not just oil, but the resource that brings our life, flame, and hope? So, to wait is to prepare. Where is the grace and the good news in this text? I think the wait is actually the good news. The alert, the challenge, you will be waiting. God is coming and you don't know the hour or when, so be prepared. Thank God we have time to prepare and we have a wait before God comes to get us. What a blessing it is that we can start thinking about these things. What is the oil in my lamp? Is the oil in my lamp more than the oil of the flame? Or is there something else that is feeding my spirit that I need to invest in? How do I go to the oil dealer before I get to the time when Jesus shows up? What is that about? 
thank God we have that good news. As we think about Advent and preparing for it, I have this idea that I've been meaning to talk to you about, and today seems like a good enough kind of day to do it. Preparation, as it were, in the waiting. Um, I have this idea for our nativity scene this year. Um, my idea is this. Frank and I, every single year, we get out our nativity sets at the church, and we look at them, and we think, which one are we putting out this year? What nativity? Are we going to do the one with the uh, one that has the broken arm on Mary? Or are we going to do the one that was donated by the family? Which nativity scene, and where are we going to put them so that we can prepare ourselves for Jesus coming? And I was sitting around, I don't thinking about something else, and I thought, what if we build just a random nativity set? What if everybody brings their own piece this year and we put them all together? So I did what any good daughter does. I called up my mom and said, hey, mom, what do you think about this? She said, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> How will those people get their pieces back if you're breaking up the nativity set? I said, what if they don't get them back? There, yeah, there was that much silence on the other end of the phone. I said, no, seriously, Mom, I've talked to many people who have just pieces of nativity. Uh, they misplaced a part during the year, or they lost something. She goes, oh, that's true. We have that nativity set that's incomplete up there that we never get out anymore. I said, that's right, you do, Mom. You remember that. I said, also, haven't you seen all those pictures of families that I don't know. Have you seen the one? There's this picture that I think of every single year of a nativity set with some child took a Darth Vader Lego piece and put it in the nativity set. I know, it sounds crazy, but Jesus called Judas, and Judas was a part of the disciples. God invites everybody to be a part of the story of the kingdom of God and the family of Christ. Have you seen the nativity set online? There's a picture up where somebody's family cat snuggles around the baby Jesus. Okay, I love cats, so I am all for a cat in the nativity set circling up baby Jesus. I've seen so many pictures, maybe you have too, of nativity scenes where children in the household bring pieces and they put them in. I've also heard stories where baby Jesus gets lost during the year. Have you heard those? We also have this theology um, that believes in the God of many faces. What if we have Christmas this year or Advent this year where we have, I don't know, 14 baby Jesuses that are in the nativity set? Would that really be bad? We talk about the God of many names, the God of many hearts, the God of many words, we know that God comes in many ways to us. What if our nativity set this year reflects that? Let's just not put the effort on three shepherds. Why don't we have the whole troop of shepherds show up? Uh, how many, wouldn't it be better if our flocks had more shepherds tending to them? Maybe that would be better. And you know there wasn't only three kings, right? We'll get to that during Advent. There was three gifts. We don't know how many magi there were. So my invitation to you this year, this might be a dreadful and awful idea, and if that's true, I'm sorry, my mom. But <laughs> I want to invite you somewhere along Advent or somewhere in the next few weeks, we'll put a bucket out in the narthex or in my office or maybe Frank's office, because why not, um, where you can bring your pieces and we can gather them. I don't know how we'll put them out. Maybe uh, on the Sunday of the Kings, we'll put them all out in the narthex, and you can look at all 27 kings that show up this year. I don't know. But I have this vision of preparing ourselves to receive the God that comes in many ways, and that getting ourselves ready means opening our eyes to see that which is new and different and unexpected, finding our nativity, having a voice in all of it? Why not? The world is messed up. How bad could this go? <laughs> Tell your friends and your family this crazy pastor decided we were going to have a big, crazy, free-for-all nativity. The ten wise, or the ten bridesmaids, the wise and the foolish. I don't know. Who are you in that story? 
Are you the one who was wise or foolish? Do you want this story to turn out differently? How do we tend to our faith in the midst of these questions of God being delayed, of peace being delayed, of, of justice in our world being delayed? How do we get our hearts right and back to God in the midst of all of the struggles that we walk through? That is where we are, that is what we hope for, and that is what we pray for. May the good news be to us that we have time in the waiting for God to meet us, for us to receive God. May it be so with you this week and always. Amen. we enter this time of prayer, let us take a moment of silence to lift up our own joys and concerns in our heart before God. Holy One, God of all grace, our prayers come to you as we are waiting and we are weary, as we are looking around and curious, as we are talking and scared. Our prayers are lifted like air balloons longing to see a bigger view and some beauty and to get away from the noise of the world just for a moment. Hear these words, O oh God, from our noisy world for the ongoing atrocities of war that we can hardly imagine. We pray for innocent people and families and children who are in the way of weapons and hostility and anger and revenge. We pray for the grief that has poured itself out and for the grief that is yet to be felt. For those who are scared all over this world, O oh God, we pray peace. Not the kind of peace that is nice, that smiles politely, but the kind of peace that is powerful, thoughtful, courageous, 
It calls out injustice and lies and brings healing and redemption. Hear these prayers for our families, for the places in our heart where division and hurt have festered and caused long-standing pain. We pray for moms and dads and grandparents and children who feel empty and lonely, for the caregivers who miss having the energy they used to, for people who've moved away in spirit or geography, for family members and friends left behind. We pray, O oh God, that you would touch our hearts like a warm blanket on a cold day and bring comfort to our soreness. Hear these prayers, O oh God, for our church, for the leadership that worked so hard on a special called annual conference yesterday, for our bishop and her team, for the churches that were approved for disaffiliation from the United Methodist Church, and for the churches that didn't finish the work needed to disaffiliate, for the churches who just want to do God's ministry and lift prayers and praise. For all of us, O oh God, we pray, let your wisdom and your inspiration move through us. Let us and all of our actions reveal good news that is truth, that is grace. And on this weekend of a Boy Scout breakfast, we give thanks. On this weekend that honors and celebrates veterans, we give thanks. On this weekend that is creeping up on the end of the year, we take a deep, deep breath and we give thanks, O oh God. We offer you our many prayers in trust and in thanksgiving that you hear us and are already at work. As we join our voices together now as one to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
When I was a child, I put a quarter in the Sunday school offering basket most weeks. Sometimes I lost the quarter on the way to Sunday school. But when I didn't lose that quarter, I got to put it in the basket and I felt like I was making a difference. I sat in a circle with other children and we passed the basket around and then our teacher led us in a prayer blessing all our giving, giving thanks for God's love. Sometimes one of the children brought in a whole dollar, but usually it was just change. But change often starts with young people. Change starts with a few small coins and can grow into something that makes a huge impact as time goes by. Today at the United Methodist Church of Vista, we are making a difference in the world by caring for our neighbors and teaching the story of Jesus and having fun with our young person, persons and celebrating in worship every week. I invite you today, please consider making a financial contribution to support the ministry that we do together. It takes a lot of quarters to keep the lights on and keep looking forward in faith. If you are able, you can use our QR code or send a check or drop a check by the office. We always love to see you. And if you think of it, write on your note. Write a note with your giving and tell us who your Sunday school teacher is who taught you to give and inspired you in faith and loved you dearly. Thank you for the shared ministry that we do together and thank you for your support of the United Methodist Church of Vista. Now I would ask that you please join me in the prayer of invitation and dedication. Holy Shepherd of all generations, we bring our gifts this morning with thanksgiving and praise. We present these tithes and offerings not from hearts of obligation or debt, but with the confidence and joy that through your love, made incarnate in your Son, Jesus, you forever removed our debt. Our joy and gratitude are hard to contain. Use our gifts and our lives to do your work of compassion, mercy, and redemption. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I did not tell you what we would do with all those pieces. 
because you have to wait to find out. Go forth now into the world, assured and confident of God's great love for you today and always. Wherever you go, however you've been, you are a beloved child of God, and we give thanks for each one of you. May you be blessed this week completely and fully. In Christ's name, amen.